so y'all, I am not going to lie. I'm a little bit overwhelmed because I'm following some amazing speakers today. So to close out a day like this is, um, is quite an interesting challenge. And so um, I'm going to talk a bit about corporate vulnerability. I'll be a bit vulnerable now and say I'm a little bit freaked out. Um, but <laughs> be kind. Um, yes. <laughs> there you are, I'm a flower, I'm blossoming in front of you. Um, my name is Monica Parker and I'm head of workplace consultancy for Morgan Lovell. And what that means is I help our clients look at the intersection between people and property and to take that understanding and leverage that for better organizational performance. Not surprisingly, um, as a little girl I didn't say when I grow up I want to be a workplace consultant. Um, and uh, although I did study design and economics in college, I've taken a few pit stops to this career. And one of those pit stops was, as Simon had mentioned, as a homicide investigator for the Department of Justice. And what I did was try to get men and women off Florida's death row who I believed didn't belong there. And I took two lessons from that work that I now carry with me in my career. And the first is this, one of my favorite quotes from Dostoevsky. Don't let us forget that the causes of human actions are usually immeasurably more complex than our subsequent explanations of them. Immeasurably more complex. We're very complex creatures. And sometimes there's no understanding why people do the things they do. The second lesson that I taught, took with me was that design and poor design of spaces can have an absolute detrimental impact on people's psyche and their well-being, in particular when we don't have control over those environments. So as a workplace consultant, most of my colleagues are interested in this. They're interested in the ROI. They want to know about cost per square foot. They want to sweat the asset. That's the term. They want to shove more people into less space. That's the reality. But I have no interest in that. What I'm interested in is ROE. And what I mean by that is return on emotion and engagement. So that's what I'm going to talk about a bit today. What are emotions and why are they still taboo in the workplace? We're really not allowed to talk about it. And the fact is, is that you know, it's been 14 years now since Daniel Goleman wrote his seminal book on emotional intelligence. And most people will agree that it requires a high degree of emotional intelligence to be a successful leader. But we still don't talk about it. And I think it's because we don't really understand what emotions are. Is it the heart? Is it the head? Is it our brain? Is it chemicals? Mark Twain, I think, said it best when he said, man is the only creature that blushes or needs to. So I think what he meant by that is actually emotions are what makes us human. And humans are what make organizations and work successful. So if we want to create this new, potentially utopian future of work, we've got to understand emotions. So there's so many emotions. How do we narrow down? How do we, how do we wrap our arms around the number of emotions someone can feel in a day? Most spiritual philosophies say that you can reduce down, you can distill down every emotion to one of two things, love and fear. So how do love and fear manifest themselves in the workplace? We'll start with love. We're not talking about workplace romance here, in case that's where you thought I was going. Um, what we're really talking about is the relationship between the employer and the employee. And the employer saying, does my employee love me or do they love me not? And that's really kind of encapsulates what employee engagement means. So employee engagement, maybe not this kind of engagement, but actually the metaphor holds very true. Because what an employer is asking is for their employees to love, honor, and cherish, to be faithful, to create a relationship with them, to be their biggest fan. And although it's rare till death do us part anymore, you are expecting your employee to be there through good times and bad. But the fact is Accenture has shown that 50% of CFOs in the world don't understand the basic economics of engagement. So what are some of the economics of engagement? These are some pretty grim statistics. 32% of UK workers are depressed or very depressed about the state of their work environment. 72% are disengaged from their work. In this Accenture study, they describe disengaged as sleepwalking through my day pretty frightening. And tw almost 20% of those 
are actively looking to undermine their coworkers' work. So let's summarize this. We got a third of people depressed. We got three quarters who are sleepwalking through their day, and then another 20% out of that are saboteurs. That's quite a motley crew that we've got working. And this is, this is you all, this is us. And the fact is, is that's costing our economy 106 billion pounds a year. That's unbelievable. So how does fear manifest itself in the work environment? Anxiety. Anxiety, and I've chosen this, what you're looking at now is an emotional equation. Um, this is from Chip Conley's book of the same title. And what Chip did is he said, you know, there are um, mathematical equations, and that is a relationship between numbers. So what he sought to do is to create relationships between words. And uh, his definition of anxiety, his emotional equation, is uncertainty times powerlessness. Now, why did I choose anxiety? I chose it because I think it's the fundamental expression of fear in the workplace, but also because it's the single most common emotion people feel in the workplace. It's so common, in fact, that it's three times more common than the next emotion that people feel. Anyone want to guess what that is? Boredom. So I think this is particularly interesting because it's anxiety equals uncertainty times powerlessness. It's not additive, it's not plus powerlessness, it's multiplicative. That means even the slightest increase of either of those factors is going to contribute to a higher degree of anxiety. What this means is we are hardwired for certainty. We're hardwired to have control over our environments. There is an interesting study that I think proves this pretty, um, pretty well. It's out of Yale University. They offered participants a choice. They said, you can have a shock any time in the next 24 hours, or you can have a shock of double the intensity at the time of your choosing. Everyone chose the shock of double the intensity. They want to know what's going to happen and when. We are hardwired for that. So I'm not one to curse the darkness without shining a light, so I'd like to tell you some of my thoughts on how we can reduce anxiety, how we can start to give people that control back and create a future of work that actually has people happy, which there's been a lot of talk about that today. The first is communication, and it's not simple communication, it's radically transparent communication. This expression of radical transparency was actually developed when talking about sustainability programming, and that we had to be radically transparent, but I think in a day and age of social networking and the way people communicate now, we've got to be radically transparent with our employees. There are a lot of organizations that want to manage expectations. They don't want to tell the whole story until they have the complete picture. But remember the shock example. People would rather have double the pain now than not know what's happening. So even if the expression of what's happening is, I don't know, is preferable to not telling our employees what's going on. But I'm going to take that a step further. And this is a term that I've coined, corporate vulnerability. Sheryl Sandberg made headlines when she said, as COO of Facebook, that she cried at work. And her explanation of this is she felt it was important for us to blur our professional selves with our personal selves, to be more authentic. But why does this matter? Why is corporate vulnerability so important? Um, I'll tell you two reasons. Because it increases trust and because it increases resiliency. This is the output from the Edelman Trust Index. I don't know if you all are familiar with this piece of work, it comes out annually. And as you can see, it's ages 25 to 64 in 20 countries. So it's a pretty robust data set. And what it says clearly is that we've absolutely lost faith and trust in our CEOs and our government officials. The social contract between employer and employee has been ripped apart. And we don't look to our leaders to lead us the way that we used to. We trust, most often, a person like ourselves. So how does corporate vulnerability help that? Well, what it does is it breaks down that barrier. When Sheryl Sandberg says, I cry at the office, and who wants to tell me? Who here has cried at the office? Who here has cried at the office but didn't want to just tell me that they would cried at the office? <laughs> OK. Um, so when Sheryl Sandberg says she cries at the office, what she's done is she's stripped away that title of COO of one of the biggest brands in the world. What she said is, I'm just another human being. And from that, now people will trust her. They'll follow her. They'll work with her more closely in a team. And through that, then the organization will be more successful. 
one of my favorite TED Talks, and if you have not seen it, it literally has changed my life, and I would encourage you to find it. It's by Brene Brown, and it's on vulnerability. And what she talks about is that the key to resiliency, the one thing that she's found about resiliency is that it is contributed by this idea of vulnerability. Abraham Maslow talks about, um, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that, that good successful businesses have a good psycho hygiene. What this means is that they are able to, to manage this bubbling off that occurs within an organization. And I believe that vulnerability, that corporate vulnerability, acts as that escape valve and it allows us to come into work feeling clean, feeling ready for the next day. So I like to end uh, my presentations with a little bit of a call to action. So a small story. Um, patients who treat their doctors with authenticity and vulnerability are more likely to get an accurate diagnosis by their doctors. And doctors, in turn, who treat their patients with authenticity and vulnerability are less likely to be sued in the case of malpractice. So it's something of a virtuous circle, I believe. So I'd like to, as a final thought for TEDx Square Mile, to say, how can we engage in a little bit of vulnerability? The simplest way is to smile at somebody you don't know. So I'd encourage you to turn around and look in this room and lock eyes with someone you don't know and give them a smile and see if we can start that virtuous circle. Thank you.